Welcome back to the second part of the lecture. In this part, we're going to have a look at the solid flux again as part of the surface energy balance. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to focus on the thermal diffusivity and see how we can determine that from observed variations in the solid temperature. And furthermore, we're going to look at a number of models for the solid flux. So ways to quantify it based on other variables rather than direct measurements. Before we can focus on determining the soil thermal diffusivity from observations, we first have to go a little bit back to the theory that we developed in one of the earlier videos. So the starting point is that we assume that the temperature varies more or less as a sine function at the top of the soil. Well, what can we learn then about the variations of the temperature at greater depth? Well, we started with the differential equation, the diffusion equation, that links the time rate of change of temperature with the vertical uh, second derivative of temperature. If we want to solve a differential equation, we need boundary conditions. So the boundary conditions that we assumed are a sine kind of function variation at the top of the uh, soil. So a variation around a mean temperature and a variation with an amplitude A and a frequency omega. And we assumed a boundary condition at the bottom where the, at infinite depth, the solid temperature is assumed to be uh, equal to the mean temperature. Well, based on the differential equation and combined with the boundary conditions, we got this expression for the temperature uh, as a function of depth and a function of time. So in all places and all times, the, the temperature varies around the mean temperature. The amplitude of the variation, A, depends on depth. And in a lower expression, we see that it, the amplitude uh, has an exponential decay with depth. And there, the depth itself plays a role, so that D, but also the capital D, which we identified as the damping depth. And furthermore, we see that the, uh, at any depth, the temperature varies again with a frequency omega, so the frequency doesn't change. But there is a phase change, and the phase change, again, depends on depth, but it also depends on the capital D, the damping depth. And you should recall here that the damping depth depends on the thermal diffusivity, as well as on the frequency. So apparently, if we have a way of determining the damping depth, we would also have a way to determine the thermal diffusivity. And that is actually the route that we're going to take. So from the equations, we have seen that we can interpret the damping depth as an evolving depth. So the depth where the surface amplitude has reduced to one over E, that is about say 30%. So here we see the temperature profile with a, in a soil of about one meter deep. And the red line shows the temperature profile during daytime and the blue line shows the temperature profile during nighttime. So there's a large swing in the temperature at the surface between say 25 degrees and five degrees. But at, for instance, about 15 centimeters deep, we see that the amplitude has reduced and the amplitude is say only about three degrees. And so it's about this depth where the amplitude at the surface has reduced to about one over E of that value. And again, in the equation below, you see that the damping depth is directly proportional to the square root of the diffusivity. So having a way of determining the damping depth also means that we have a method to determine the soil thermal diffusivity. But we should be careful when we look at imposing the surface temperature as a boundary condition. Of course, that's the way the whole thing was derived. But if we want to interpret physically what a difference in damping depth actually means, we should rather say that we have an equal boundary condition of the soil heat flux. So if we have a certain soil heat flux as an upper boundary, then if we have a large damping depth, the heat that we uh, input to the soil is distributed over a larger depth than if we have a small damping depth. 
And that means that the difference in damping depth actually has an impact on the variation in the surface temperature. So here we see that for the soil with a damping depth of about 15 centimeters, the surface temperature has a much smaller variation than for the soil with a damping depth of 5 centimeters. Still, it's the same amount of heat that has been stored in the soil. But for the soil with a large damping depth, that heat storage takes place over a large depth, whereas for the soil with the small damping depths, it's only the upper layer that is active, and the deeper layers don't contribute to storage of heat. Let us see what this concept of damping actually means in kind of reality. Of course, this is an idealized uh, picture of how the temperature varies, but at least it uh, illustrates what is happening. So we focus on the diurnal cycle. So this is one diurnal cycle, 24 hours, and the blue line shows the boundary condition at the top. So it's the temperature at the top of the soil, which varies between 25 degrees during noon and 5 degrees at night. And then if we go to 10 centimeters depth, we see that the amplitude of the temperature variation is considerably reduced, but also we see that the maximum temperature has shifted in, in time. So there is a phase shift. And if you go even deeper to about 20 centimeters, we see that the amplitude has reduced even further and also the phase shift uh, is larger. Then if we go to the yearly cycle, which could also be more or less assumed to be sinusoidal, if we then focus on these first three lines that we saw in the previous graph, so at the depth of uh, the surface, 10 centimeters and 20 centimeters, we can hardly distinguish these lines. So apparently at the scale of a year, it doesn't really matter whether you are at the surface or at 20 centimeter depth, the variation in temperature is more or less the same. But then if we include larger depth, one meter, two meter and four meters, there again, we see the same pattern. We see a reduction in amplitude and also we see a shift in phase. Well, those were very idealized pictures uh, showing only the diurnal cycle and the yearly cycle, but there are also subdiurnal cycle uh, timescales involved. And here we have an example from observations made during the night, where we very clearly see the red line being the soil heat flux, which shows quite erratic behavior. And especially the first night, we see a large reduction in the soil heat flux, uh, which coincides with a variation in the net radiation, which is the green line, but also with the sensible heat flux, which is the black line. And furthermore, for instance, the rightmost picture, there we see that there's a large variation in the um, solid flux at the start of the night. So there's a large drop in the solid flux from zero to about minus 70 watts per square meter within about one hour. But then if the night further progresses, the solid flux goes back to about 30 watts per square meter within a few hours again. So those are variations that can not just be described with a simple sin sinus function. We need to have something uh, more complex for that. And actually, you could see these as higher harmonics of the diurnal cycle. A similar thing can happen if we look at, for instance, uh, a daytime situation where clouds are involved. So here we have a situation where actually we had a solid flux plate buried very close to the surface, uh, that is the solid line and one that is buried about five centimeters down uh, below the surface. And the solid flux plate really very close to the surface sees a significant reduction in the solid flux, even to a negative value at around 12 UTC. And that is related to a small cloud passing by. If you look at the variation of the solid flux at five centimeters depth, well, this significant drop is not visible. So here you see the effect of higher harmonics, which have a very much higher frequency than that of the diurnal cycle. And here you see that the amplitude is very quickly damped. So a significant amplitude at the surface is no longer visible at five centimeters depth. Well, until now we have only looked qualitatively at these variations of temperature with depth and time. 
So focusing on the idealized pictures, but also I showed you some exceptional cases where even the diurnal cycle is not fast enough. And so we had uh, subdiurnal uh, variations in time. But what is all this good for? Well, we have this expression that tells us how the temperature varies with depth and with time. And again, we also have observations where we see that indeed the solid temperature varies with depth and with time. And we can link those two. And so let's start with the situation where we focus on the phase shift that occurs in the sinusoidal description of the temperature. In the figure here, we see that indeed the maximum temperature that uh, we observe at a, a location close to the surface occurs earlier than the maximum at some depth. And the phase shift between those two maxima actually gives us information about the damping depth because the phase shift is directly related to the damping depth. So what you can do here is observe the phase shift look at the expression that links the phase shift to the damping depth and then determine the damping depth from that. And then from the definition of the damping depth, you also know the thermal diffusivity. So that is one route to determine damping depth and the thermal diffusivity. In the same observations, we see that the amplitude of the temperature variation decreases with depth. And that is completely consistent with the expression that we have where we talked about the E folding depth of the amplitude. And so comparing the amplitude of the temperature variation at the surface or at some depth close to the surface with that at a greater depth, we can determine the damping depth as well because we know how the amplitude varies with depth at least according to the idealized figure. So now we have two routes to determine the damping depth and from that the thermal diffusivity, either through the time shift to the left or looking at the amplitude to the right. Now that we have all of this theory in place, and particularly the expressions you see at the top here, which shows the variation of temperature with depth and with time, it is time to make an exercise. So what we start with is the assumption that we have an homogeneous soil, which means that the soil thermal properties are the same at any depth. It's not particularly realistic, but for now we assume that because that makes it at least doable to make this exercise. Well, we have an homogeneous soil. We know that we look at the diurnal cycle. And furthermore, it's given that the maximum soil temperature at the surface occurs at 1 p.m. On the other hand, the maximum at 20 centimeters depth occurs at half past 7 p.m. Uh, that's not in... Uh, necessarily the same as you see in the picture, but just focus on the numbers I give you in the exercise. And the question to you is, please calculate the damping depth for that case. And also from that, from the damping depth, calculate the thermal diffusivity. Well, now it's time for you to take your calculator, pen and paper and do the exercise. It takes some time to do the calculation. I will be patient. Welcome back. I hope you managed to do the calculations. So let's see to what extent your answers are similar to mine. Well, the starting point is this expression for the temperature variation with depth and time. Well, this is what follows from the differential equations. And as I said before, we focus on the phase shift, so Z over D. But what does this Z over D actually look like if we look at the observations? So then we introduce the delta t as the observed phase shift and to clarify that it is a phase shift in time we just rearrange the equation a little bit so we kept the frequency omega outside of the parentheses and the time now is the time minus the phase shift so if we compare the two expressions we see that omega times delta t should be equal to the phase shift z over d so this gives us some idea of how we could work on this well the observed phase shift is six and a half hours and well hours are nice things but all of this is expressed in basic si units so we should convert that into seconds and the frequency for the diurnal cycle um, is 
2 pi over uh, 86,400 seconds. And so if we look at which part of the full diurnal cycle uh, this phase shift uh, represents, it's 1.7 radians. At the same time, we know that the phase shift is equal to the depth difference be divided by the uh, damping depth. Well, the depth difference in this case is 20 centimeters because we go from the surface, which is zero uh, to 20 centimeters depth. And so we know the phase shift, we know the uh, change in depth, and from that we can determine the damping depth. That just follows from the equation. So the damping depth in this case is about 12 centimeters. Well, that is half of the answers. Now the question is, what is the magnitude of the thermal diffusivity? For that we need the uh, frequency, and here you see that it's about 7.32 times 10 to the power minus 5 per second. And using the expression for the damping depth and just rewriting that, we get an expression for the thermal diffusivity and the value that we get out is uh, half times 10 to the power minus 6 meters square per second and it is a reasonable value if we compare that to the values we have seen in the table 2.2 before well we had the expression for the variation of temperature with depth and with time but we also know that the solid flux is just the vertical derivative of temperature uh, times the uh, thermal conductivity. Well, we can take the vertical derivative of the expression that we have, multiply it with the thermal conductivity, and then we get an expression for the solute flux. It's a very ugly expression, I, I immediately admit that. But you see that the variation of the solute flux indeed has the same period as the uh, variation of temperature. And that, of course, makes sense. So if the temperature has a diurnal cycle, the solid flux also have, has a diurnal cycle. And the magnitude of the solid flux decreases with depth. Well, that also makes sense because uh, if you have during daytime a large downward uh, solid flux, uh, we also know that the solid heats up, uh, you lose some heat flux. And that means that the solid flux at great depth should be smaller. And that was actually exactly the problem that we had with the solid flux plate measurements that if we bury that at say five centimeter depth that we would underestimate the surface solid flux. We also see that there's a phase shift so just the same way as we had in the for the temperature there's also a phase shift for the solid flux but it is different. It is shifted 45 degrees relative to that of the temperature. So that means that there's a phase shift of about three hours during daytime and one and a half months for the yearly cycle. Now it is time to make the step to the modeling of the soil heat flux. And the first method that we're going to look at is the so-called force restore method. It was developed because solving the diffusion equation is quite expensive in terms of computations. And of course our computers are far, getting faster and faster, but still solving the diffusion equation in a situation where you have very steep gradients and especially close to the surface there are steep gradients is still intensive and furthermore the nice thing of the force restore method is that it is relatively simple and it shows important things that are still relevant for atmospheric and climate models here we look at a very simple two-layer system and we have a thin top layer and there's a deep bulk layer below and the idea is that the uh, bulk layer has a constant temperature. So it is a very slow system and actually it doesn't vary at all in time. So you could think of that as the layer where the mean yearly temperature uh, occurs or the mean daily temperature occurs. And that means that all of the variation of the temperature should occur in the upper layer. So the dynamics is in the upper layer, the slow or the constant uh, uh, value of the temperature is in the deeper layer. Still, we would like to have the top layer to have the correct amplitude of the temperature. And especially the upper layer should have the correct uh, amplitude of the surface temperature of the soil. And also it should have the correct phase. So we make a very simple system, but we are still very strict in our requirements. The upper layer should have the correct amplitude, 
and the correct phase as compared to the normal surface temperature. Because it's if you think in terms of a climate model or a weather model, it's this upper layer that, so to say, talks to the atmosphere. So that gives the information about the status of the soil. It communicates that to the atmosphere. Well, to understand what's happening, we look at the energy balance of this top layer. So it is forced by net radiation and it loses energy by sensible heat flux and latent heat, at least if we look at the daytime situation. And at the surface, there is a solid flux into this top layer of G0. And well, these four terms of the energy balance should uh, balance. At the bottom of the top layer, there's a solid flux G1 that goes into the bulk layer. So the top layer and the bulk layer communicate with each other through the solid flux G1, which happens at the interface. The temperature dynamics of the top layer uh, de depends on the difference between the solid flux at the surface of the top layer and at the bottom of the top layer. So it's the difference between these two fluxes that determines how the temperature of the top layer varies. And again, very similar to what we saw in the calorimetric method in the previous uh, lecture, we see that the uh, variation of temperature also depends inversely on the uh, heat capacity and on the depth of the layer. Well, if we then look at expressions that we can come up with for the two heat fluxes, well, the Heat flux at the top is equal to the net radiation minus sensible heat flux minus latent heat flux. And we model or we parameterize the solid flux at the bottom of our top layer by something that depends on the temperature difference between the top layer and the bottom layer. That makes sense. And there's a capital lambda in front, which you could interpret as a kind of a conductivity. More importantly, is the interpretation of these two terms. So if you look at how the temperature of the top layer varies, it depends on a forcing in terms of the radiation forcing at the top. And there's a restoring term that tries to keep the top layer close to the bottom temperature. So on the one hand, radiation during daytime uh, tries to uh, force the temperature of the top layer away from the bottom layer temperature, whereas the bottom layer itself, by uh, connecting uh, to the top layer, tries to keep or restore the temperature of the top layer close to its own temperature. So that's where the term force restore comes from. There are two variables that are important here. It's the depth of the top layer and it is the uh, conductivity that connects the two layers. Uh, those are the determining factors and we have to choose those in a proper way to make sure that the dynamics of the top layer temperature is equal to the dynamics of the actual surface temperature. Well, we will not go very deeply into the mathematics, but uh, mathematically the system is as we saw before and we have certain requirements for the depth of the top layer and the conductivity. And the requirements are that the temperature variation of the top layer should have the correct amplitude and it should have the right phase. Well, for the left hand side of the equation, we use the uh, temperature as a function of time with the sinus forcing. And for the right hand side, we borrow the expression we had for the solid flux at the surface that we developed before. And we have the variation of the temperature in the restoring term that also has a sine function. So if we include that, we get the next expression. And the red and the green part, we actually know exactly how it varies because we developed a model for that. And then if we bring all of this together, this can only be an equality if we have the following expressions, expressions for the uh, conductivity and the depth of the top layer. And apart from the exact form, that's not that important. But the main message here is that the conductivity, the capital lambda, and the depth of the top layer depend on two things. 
they depend on the soil thermal diffusivity and they depend on the period. Well, if in a certain model, say in a climate or weather model, you know the type of soil, you could still say, okay, I, then I also know the soil thermal diffusivity. But the time period is now kind of fixed. So if you choose a certain depth of the top layer, that actually implies that you impose a certain period. And we have seen that variations in temperature can uh, have a diurnal cycle, then can have a yearly cycle, but they can also have variation on, the, on a much uh, smaller time scale. So that actually means that there's not just one omega, just one period, but there are multiple periods. So that actually means that choosing just one depth of the top layer only suits one value for omega, and that is not how reality works. So that, that actually is the reason why any uh, weather or climate model has multiple layers, at least four or five, to uh, account for the different timescales that occur in the temperature forces. Another situation where we need to do some modeling of the solid flux is actually when we have a vegetation layer. Until now, it was the top of the soil that was directly in contact with the atmosphere. But if we have a vegetation layer, it's actually the top of the vegetation that is connected to the atmosphere. And we need to make sure that the top of the vegetation has the right temperature, such that the outgoing long wave radiation and also the sensible heat flux uh, gives the right values. The trick that we play here is that the vegetation layer is actually added to the soil and we assume that the soil heat flux or actually the heat flux through this vegetation layer is the same as the soil heat flux at the top of the soil. So in fact we say that there's no heat flux divergence in the vegetation. Well if we know this soil heat flux through the vegetation we can uh, connect that to the temperature difference between the top of the vegetation and the top of the soil. And the thing that's connected is solid flux or is heat flux through the vegetation, and this temperature difference is the skin layer conductivity. It's a capital, capital lambda subscript vegetation. And it has a typical order empirically of about 5 watts per square meter per Kelvin. So that means that if you would have a solid flux of, for instance, 10 watts per square meter, that would mean that there would be a temperature difference between the Top of the vegetation and the top of the soil of 2 Kelvin. Now it is time to summarize. So the first thing that we looked at is ways to determine the damping depth from observed temperature variations. So if we have observations of temperature in the soil at two depths, we can either use variations in the amplitude of that temperature or the phase shift between the two depths to determine the damping depth. And once we have the damping depth from the definition, we can also determine the soil thermal diffusivity. Furthermore, we looked at two methods that we can use to model or estimate the soil heat flux. The first method is the force restore method, which is quite close to what we use in atmospheric and climate models. And the message there was that the depth of the layer that you use is directly coupled both to the frequency of the temperature variation and also to the soil thermal diffusivity. And furthermore, we looked at the way you can model the uh, vegetation layer and the effect that has on the coupling between the temperature at the top of the vegetation layer and the temperature at the top of the soil.